Hey guys, Bugcat7 here. Okay, it is Friday, February 14, 2020, and I'd like to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. I really do appreciate it. Alright guys, well, we're going to continue with my series on the quote-unquote giants, or large hominids as I like to call them state by state and we're going to cover Nebraska and Kansas in this video and how more appropriate could it be than to look into Valentine Nebraska on Valentine's Day a seven foot warrior thoroughly good Indians it's just interesting how they say this thoroughly good Indians Canal workers at Valentine, Nebraska recently uncovered 10 feet beneath the surface the skeleton of an Indian warrior. The overlying strata indicated that the bones had been inanimate for several hundred years. On July 13th, Professor Skinner of the American Indian Museum, excavating the mound at Tioga Point near Sayre, Pennsylvania uncovered the bones of 68 men, which he estimates have been buried at least seven or eight hundred years. The average height indicated by the skeletons was seven feet, but many were taller. Evidences of the giant size of these men was seen in huge axes found beside the bones, says the Christian Herald. Grand Rapids Tribune, Grand Rapids, Wisconsin, November 9, 1916. So how more appropriate than this seven-foot warrior found uh, 10 feet beneath the surface. And, you know, by saying it's several hundred years, and then they say these other ones that were found in Pennsylvania by the same Professor Skinner, I guess, seven or eight hundred years. And who, you know, just goes to show you their whole reading of the strata is all mixed up and backwards because the America is very different than anywhere else in the world and uh, they made up their own story about it and you know these some of these articles go over that Junction City Nebraska giant skull and thigh bone a skull and thigh bone found represent a human of gigantic stature the skull is said to contain several small holes. It was surmised that this was the result of a shotgun. I would suggest that the author may not have seen the skulls and may be operating on a bad premise. On large skulls of this type, skulls found up to 3,200 cc's found in Peru had small holes where blood vessels formed small holes in the back of the skull to feed the skull blood. Another possibility that when a skull does not develop these holes on their own, then surgeries performed in these holes may have been the result of trepanation. Well, maybe, but, you know, as far as the first premise is concerned, yeah, see, even average, regular human beings have skulls have small holes to allow blood vessels and nerves to get to the facial muscles. You know, how else is it going to get there? You know, the skull is, you know, self-contained unit there, so... You know, the only way for those things to get there is, you know, either over the surface through the neck, which is not how it's done. It goes through tiny holes in the, in the skull. And it, these are more pronounced on these, you know, larger skulls and elongated skulls. The excavation was done on a farm of John Nolan, slightly northwest of Junction City. While leveling a mound in his wheat field, Nolan uncovered several human skulls and a lot of human bones and teeth. Examination confirmed that the shape of the skull is not like a, 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 any tribe known to exist in the area, and indeed they were not Indian. The tools and utensils were unlike any of the relics known of, Indi of Indians to use. A strange brown substance was found in the cairn, but was not examined. It was speculated that the facial characteristics were more Caucasian, however. The old timers in the area had no knowledge of any white settlers being buried there. Okay, so this is interesting. 
and whatever this brown substance was that they didn't examine, you know, what was it? You know, see, these are the kind of small details or whatever, but, you know, just by overlooking these things, you never get to the bottom of anything. Nebraska Los, man, and Los refers to drift or anything like that, that they claim that the glaciers left behind and all this kind of nonsense which is all a bunch of theories and hypotheses. They have no idea what left any of this stuff behind, but that's their only explanation. But it isn't the only explanation. There's explanations you never heard of, and you hear some of them on my channel, but it might be a totally different explanation for these things. Okay, so Nebraska Los Man. Our skulls of ancient men whatever it was, did cut off some of the title. Robert F. Gilder presents interesting find to State University. Data is told by Earth Strata. Archaeologists are able to approximately determine when men live by deposit in which bones are found. If clay and soil deposits in their various layers did not read like an open book to the archaeologists on points of time, speculations as to the age of skulls found deep in the earth would not be made with any degree of accuracy. But strata of clay, gravel, glacial deposit, and loss are an open page to those who know how to read them. Thus, skulls found in various deposits are placed in the age in which that particular deposit was deposited where the skull is found. These facts are what gives significance to three skulls just presented to the University of Nebraska School of Medicine in Omaha by Robert F. Gilder, archaeologist in the field for the University of Nebraska. Mr. Gilder has made a collection of archaeological and anthropological specimens for years. He has dug hundreds of old skulls from the depths of Nebraska soil and has unearthed many of the secrets of Nebraska mound builders, who probably thrived here many hundreds of years before the American Indians ever drew a bow and a vice on a bison. One antedates other two. But one of these three skulls antedates the other two, not by hundreds of years, but by thousands. In the opinion, some of the leading of the leading geologists who have placed it in the history of the world by the Los clay in which it was found on the farm of Emmanuel Long, three miles north of Florence a few years ago. A dozen skulls were taken from the same excavation by Mr. Gilder at that time. The one he now presents to the University of Nebraska School of Medicine has been named Nebraska Los Man Number 8. This because it was the eighth skull removed from this excavation. Dr. George E. Condra of the Department of Geography and Geology of the University of Nebraska and E. H. Barber, head of the Department of Geology of the University of Nebraska, both examined the Lowe's clay in the pit where the skulls were found and estimated that the clay was deposited there about 20,000 years ago. Okay, so you're showing a picture of this skull, 20,000 years old. And this was a fantastic claim at the time that this article was written because <clears throat> Alice Herdlishka of the Bureau of Ethnology of the Smithsonian did not believe that any um, trace of mankind was in the Americas before 4,000 years ago up into the 1940s she believed that despite the fact that lots of archaeology was done showing much older um, habitation Indian is next. Then comes the American Indian. This skull is the third in this Mr. Gilder's gift to the school. It was taken from an excavation he made on the Ponce Creek on the farm of Frank Parker, two miles north of Florence. The Indian to whom this skull belongs is thought to have been buried about 100 years ago. Metal fringe and glass beads were found in the grave which would indicate a comparatively modern Indian and would also indicate contact with the whites. 
Here is the skull, the frontal bone of which is painted red, just as the Indians painted it before the skull was buried. It is thought that the body was allowed to lie out until the flesh was picked off by the birds and until the bones were bleached before it was buried. Then the forehead was painted before burial. Here is a forehead also that has no such superciliary ridges over the eyes or as that of the of the uh, uh, right that has no such superciliary superciliary ridges as has that of the lost man. The ridges over the eyes are even less pronounced than those of the mound builders, but they can be seen even as they may be seen still in many civilized men of today. But this Indian had little use for the strong bony fortification over the eyes. He fought his battles with bows and arrows, also with knives. His enemies used similar weapons, so bony ridges over the eyes were not as useful as dexterity of arms, nimbleness. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, nimbleness in the feet and brains for cunning in the skull. So this Indian has a greater brain capacity than either the Los man. Brain capacity than either uh, or the mound builder. His forehead is better developed and his head is wider. And here it says, um, like that of an ape. Now to evolutionists, this is very interesting for a glance at the skull will suggest the skull of an ape or orangutan rather than that of a man. And why not, say the archaeologists, for that was a long time ago, and we all know that civilization had not made very big leaps at that time. Pretty laughable. We had no trust bosses then to sit in swivel chairs and manipulate finances, making millions with a nod of their head. It was not a matter of making millions then, it was a matter of capturing a hind quarter of some wild beast of the forest for food. When game was scarce, it was a matter of battling the brain, batting the brains out of your neighbor with a stone cudgel to get him out of the way so that you might have the hunk of meat he had killed. As the old frontiersman says, it took a man to live in them days. So did it require a combination of fighting flesh and bone to walk with the earth then and survive. Skull was thick. South Nebraska Lowe's man of eight, being one who was fit to survive in them hardy times, had a superciliary ridge over each eye that would ward off a lick from a ball bat swung by some of the league players of the present day. He had almost no forehead at all. The superciliary ridge over each eye is as pronounced as a flange on a car wheel. While back of this ridge, the skull slopes back to the rear of his head. This man expected to take knocks. <clears throat> Nature fitted him to receive jolts from rocks and clubs hurled at him by his enemies. The bone ridge over each eye would protect his eyes from the blows of his enemies, while the sloping head from their backwards would allow all missiles to glance off harmlessly. There was not much room for brains in this skull. Likewise, there was not much need for brains in this man's time. The other fellow was no smarter than Lowe's man number eight, and so instead of matching brains, they matched cudgels, and frontal bones and nature's superciliary armor found under mound. These skulls were found in undisturbed clay about seven feet beneath an old mound north of Florence. Scientists have come here from France, Germany, and Russia to view these skulls for the anthropological interest they hold. They have been pronounced the best specimens of ancient man next to the famous Neanderthal skull which was discovered in Germany some years ago, and which is looked upon as just a small step removed from the ape stage. Along with this skull and Mr. Gilder's gift to the medical school, 
goes to the skull of the Nebraska Mound Builder, estimated to be 2,000 years old. This was found in a mound just south of Coffin Springs in Sharpie County, Nebraska. S 72 skulls Mr. Gilder took out of this mound in an excavation about 62 by 34 feet. Pottery, stone implements, and shell beads were found also in the excavation. This skull has much more pronounced forehead than the low skull. In fact, there is almost no comparison, although the mound builder has no forehead to compare favorably with the average intelligent American citizen today. Also, the superciliary or superorbital ridge over the eye is no longer so pronounced. The ridge can, of course, be seen. Okay, so the thing is here, okay, this is something that they didn't know, nobody still knows, and it's all recent scientific um, research that has been done into brains, okay? And one of the things that was found by this relatively new research within the past 10 or 15 years, I read this article about it, and they were examining, uh, you know, the memory of pigeons it was one of the subjects, and what they were astonished to find was is that pigeons can remember up to 10,000 different things. So they were surprised at that. They, they didn't think that that was really possible, but it's true. So part of the results of the study was that Intelligence doesn't necessarily have to do with size of brain or brain capacity, okay? Like the octopus, for instance. You know, octopus has a big brain for its size, but it doesn't have a big brain like a human brain, okay? It's one of the smartest animals on the planet, okay? Dolphin has a bigger brain than us and more complex brain than us. And some scientists say that they actually dolphins could be more intelligent than us. Just the context that they're in is just there's no comparison. So it's not necessary for them to develop it to any degree like we have to. So the end result of the data of the study was is that intelligence has to do with more of the structure of the brain not its size. The size may have to do, have something to do with more retention capability to remember more stuff, but not necessarily the level of intelligence. That has more to do with the structure of the brain, you see? So all this stuff about brain capacity has something to do with the level of intelligence. Well, apparently not. So it has more to do with structure than size, see? So anyway, it's interesting what they say and you know, how, you know, even people can read this and, you know, misunderstand what's really being said. And obviously these people have a certain level of intelligence, well, in some areas, better than some people today who have no idea about any of these things, astronomy, mathematics, you know, whatever it is. Okay, and here's just two pictures of skulls. This is a Nebraska Mound Builder skull, this one here, and that's 2,000 years old. And here's an American Indian, 100 years old. You can see the difference in size, the width, the shape. You see, this is 1913, this is 20th century. And the, they just have this picture, no article associated with it, just an image. But sometimes that's all they can get is an image and, a, you know, something like this. Some people ask, where are the bones if they are skeptical? As a giantologist, we ask something different. You see, we have uncovered thousands of articles from every state, tens of thousands of them here in the states, and sometimes as much as from 
26 sources for one repeated article. Also, throughout history, we see photographs and bring those to the public. We replicate them based on the measurements when we can. So knowing there were giants, we asked something different. We asked, where are the bones? Which is a very different question with multiple lines of authenticity. A trail is left, and that trail leads to academia. So we have a target to ask that question and these photos should be sufficient for the skeptics asking about bones but it only invalidates the skeptics asking but it validates the giantologists so while ignoring the skeptics we ask where are the bones academia well we know a lot of them just dis disintegrated into dust but whatever ones were left that's right where are they nobody knows Okay, well, here's a giant mummy, nine-foot mummy for you, Gage County Mummy. James Norris brought this to the attention of Jim Vieira. His grandfather claimed to have unearthed this in Gage County, Nebraska. He took it and got a portrait of it with his friend, he said. William Norris on the right was six feet tall, and they unearthed this nine-foot mummy. The family claimed that it was a real find. Jim Vieira and Hugh Newman found another nine-foot mummy account from Nebraska as well. So here's, I guess, a photo, postcard photo, whatever. It might be a portrait of this mummy here holding something. And, uh, okay, where did it go? But here's some evidence of it in a photograph. And, you know, is it a fake? I mean, you know, it's like anything in this world. It's like selling fake anything. You know, you take that risk and you get caught and get in trouble. I mean, only, you know, crazy people do stuff like that. You know. Reno County, hips two feet in length. They were bones. They were bones, and it made no difference. So we're in um, Kansas, I believe now, Reno County, Kansas. John Shore of Reno County, while engaged in picking up bones in the vicinity of the head of the nine cottonwoods, picked up the skeleton of a man. The frame was complete, with the exception of the skull. The bones were all very large, and the hip bone in particular, it, measure, it measuring nearly near two feet in length. The bones were piled on the wagon with the others, buffalo and the like, and all carried away to spread on the impoverished hills of the east. The former occupant of the frame is supposed to have been an Indian. So they took the bones along with whatever other bones they found in the vicinity and just threw them somewhere to add to the soil to uh, increase its, uh, you know, um, viability there, you know, to enhance the soil over there. So, you know, these are the kind of things that happen to these things, and that's why there's no evidence of them, because all these things happen to them and you know just unfortunately for us that's the problem and finding one now be near impossible and even if you do you get in trouble I think that was it right yeah Erie Giants 310 to 12 feet tall Skeletons of men 10 feet high found in a cave. And it's interesting, this is another type of internment, burial, whatever you want to call it. It's, you know, frequently in these caves, um, probably natural caves, but this was another type and style of burial of these rather large people. And sometimes in vaults in caves, as we heard about in places like Tennessee and Kentucky. Why, this man was 10 or 12 feet high, exclamation point. Thunder and lightning, exclaimed Farmer Porter in astonishment. 
the first speaker who has won local distinction as a scientist, reiterated his assertion. J.H. Porter has a farm near Northeast, not many miles from where the Lakeshore Railroad crosses the New York State boundary line. Early this week, some workmen in Mr. Porter's employ came upon the entrance to a cave on, and on entering, it found heaps of human bones within. Many skeletons were complete, and specimens of the find were brought out and exhibited to the natural, the naturalists and archaeologists of the neighborhood. They informed the wandering bystanders that the remains were unmistakably those of giants. The entire village of Northeast was aroused by the discovery, and today hundreds of people from the city took advantage of their holiday to visit the scene. It was at first conjectured that the remains were those of soldiers killed in a battle with the Indians that abounded in the vicinity during the last century, but the size of the skulls and length of the leg bones dispelled that theory. So far, about 150 giant skeletons of powerful proportions have been exhumed, and indications point to a second cave eastward, which may probably contain as many more. Scientists who have exhumed skeletons and made careful measurements of the bones say that they are the remains of a race of gigantic creatures, compared with which our tallest men would appear as pygmies. There are no arrowheads, stone hatchets, or other implements of war with the bodies. Some of the bones are on exhibition in the various stores. One is as thick as a good-sized bucket. So, just another large burial in these caves and more bones of who knows where, what happened to them and where they went. And... This is from 1885, Waukini, Kansas. Pittsburgh, giant tooth from coal bed. I find this very interesting. The size of the tooth is just incredible size and where it was found. Weighing four ounces, tooth of prehistoric giant found in Kansas coal bed, Pittsburgh, Kansas. Can you imagine a prehistoric man whose tooth would weigh four ounces, a tooth which would take a wire cable to pull? Such a tooth has been found in a coal bed more than 600 feet under the ground. So 600 feet under the ground. The tooth was found about two miles northwest west of Pittsburgh in a coal mine. Dentists claimed that because of certain formations, it could be nothing but a grinder from the head of a prehistoric man. While it is light and appears to be bone, it is in per a perfect state of petrification. The prehistoric giant who had such a tooth easily could have opened his mouth 12 inches wide. He must have been about 12 feet in height and able to have taken a six-foot step. Okay, so just what is this huge tooth being found in 600 feet into a mine and the whole story of coal and how it's formed and where it came from and everything just a, bears another look, folks. There's some people who challenge mainstream ideas on that. Okay, burial pit of seven foot Selena giants. Indian burial pit of giants. And here's a photograph. Indian burial pit, the hunchback Selena, Kansas. So I call this guy a hunchback. Howard Corp found the site of the Whitefords began on, and the Whitefords. Howard Corp found the site, and the White first began unearthing skeletons, according to the Historical Society document. We have discovered a burial pit and have been working on it for the past week, have unearthed more than 50 skeletons, eight small pots. The White first wrote in a letter to a Smithsonian friend, uh-oh, Walter Weddell, recounted in the Historical Society publication, 
A day after writing the letter, the Selena Journal wrote about the discovery. People wanted to see the bones. Guy Whiteford wrote to Waddell that it was going to cost them. People paid the 25 cents to get a glimpse and a Kansas tourism attraction was born, becoming very popular over the years. The property eventually sold and the Whiteford's moved into the farmhouse by the burial site and gave tours. According to the Historical Society article, the couple lived there until the late 1940s when the current owners, as Mabel put it, wanted to take over the site and its profits. The site continued as a tourist attraction, but in the 1980s, an attorney for the Pawnee sought to have the bones reburied. So you see that right there. So that's why we're never going to get to the bottom of human history around the world. And if we got it, going to discount the Americas, that's where the biggest mistake is made. And, uh, you know, I was talking with Jimmy and, you know, uh, Graham Hancock was one of the people who said that what's going on in the northeast of North America could unlock a whole different story of the past and many things could elsewhere like in Kansas here okay but we're not going to get to look at them if they're going to be all the bones get reburied so Kansas laws concerning unmarked burial sites changed in 1989 with Selena's site at the height of the discussions according to the to an article in the Selena Journal by, the 1990, by 1990, the site was closed and the bones were covered in blankets and buried again following a rededication ceremony by members of the Pawnee Nation believed to be the closest descendants. Okay, well, that may be true. Who knows? But how would that be? Obviously, different frame and body type and skulls and everything. This valley was inhabited by men whose average height was probably well over six feet. These were not the Indians of Quivera, whose seven-foot warriors Coronado described in 1541, but an even earlier people. Here they lived in earth lodges, tilling the soil, hunting and fishing, and here they left records of unusual archaeological importance. One mile southeast of this market is a burial pit containing more than 140 skeletal remains that demonstrate the remarkable size and strength of these prehistoric Indians. Discovery of an Indian communal burial ground believed to contain the remains of a tribe that roamed the plains of central Kansas more than 5,000 years ago has been made five miles east of here by Guy T. Whiteford, policeman archaeologist. Whiteford said he already has excavated 27 skulls and three complete skeletons, one of which he asserted was seven feet tall. So there's uh, various um, publications found in Miami Daily News, Miami, Oklahoma, October 11, 1936. So. refers to these other articles here okay guys well just again you know Nebraska and Kansas are just more states where large skeletal remains can be found and inexplicable um, skeletal remains and what have become of them what has been said about them this whole thing where yeah, the poor knee are the closest relatives. In what way? How can they explain that? They can't explain it. The whole thing is left unexplained. And we're just supposed to take it on the face of it, which explains nothing. And they don't have any way of explaining it. And don't want to for various reasons. There's no explanation for people starting large and getting small. What happened? Their theory about evolution is that you start small and you get big, but we stop growing for some reason, according to the people who do research on height. Okay, I've read all the papers and everything else on the history of height and current science on height. We stop growing for some reason and they don't know why. 
it's not in accordance with their theory. Good health, good nutrition, good medical care, good communities, etc. We should be just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and we stop. And you know, why we didn't grow that much to begin with? Average size is like five seven, five eight still. It's not bigger than that. All right, guys. So, in any case, I hope you enjoyed those uh, couple of states. And we're going to move on. We're going to move into the next couple of states, most likely. And there's good stuff left to come because some of these states just have long lists of accounts and fascinating stuff, just like every state has so far. All right. So, anyway, if you like the video, please hit the like button. But that's seven. Signing out. Peace.